So, dude, what's this video about? <laughs> Remember what we were talking about again? So, what's up about today? <laughs> Alright. What's going on, guys? My name is Kenji, and welcome back to my channel. I'm here again with Karma Medic. Yup. And today we've got another video for you guys coming. I think it's our fifth video we've done together. Yeah, something like that. Um, and instead of answering a question today, we thought we'd talk about a specific topic in medicine which we think will be really helpful in the MMI interview. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about consent. So what it is, um, why it's important, the different types of consent. Who needs it? Who needs it? Just everything to do with consent. Um, so yeah. Yeah, so consent is going to be really important in your interviews, guys. Consent comes up in MMIs all the time. Mm -hmm. And if it's not directly asking, asked in a question, you're probably going to want to bring it up to show knowledge of consent yeah. um, and how it plays into different situations. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, let's jump straight into it. Let's jump straight into it. So do you want to start off by telling us what consent is, bro? Yeah, so consent is um, basically when you've explained to the patient everything that they need to know, mm -hmm. um, any alternatives, any risks, any harms, any benefits of what it is they want to do to them, whether it's a procedure or management, mm -hmm. and then they explicitly say to you, yes, that's okay, <coughs> yes, please go ahead and do that, mm -hmm. whatever it is. So it's the patient confirming that they want something done. Definitely. And there are two different types of consent. There's explicit, three, three different types of consent. There's explicit, there's implied, and there's advanced consent as well. Yeah. So explicit consent is basically where they actively say to you that you can do the procedure. So they, they either do it in writing or they do it verbally and they give you uh, explicit consent. Uh, implied consent, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so implied consent is when, for example, if you're sitting with a patient and you ask to take their blood pressure and they present you with their arm. So you can assume that they are giving you consent because they're showing you their arm. Um, but you want to be careful with this because it can be kind of tricky and you want to make sure that they're actually saying and giving you consent as opposed to just moving their hand and you imply or exactly. sorry, you take that to be consent mm -hmm. from them. Yeah. And the last type of consent is advanced consent. So this is um, when you tell, tell the doctor in advance that you want a certain type of treatment. <clears throat> so for example, if a patient has dementia and they're going to lose um, capacity mm -hmm. um, and they also have cancer, for example, it's a bit of an extre extreme example, but it's valid. Uh, so let's say yeah, they have dementia and they also have cancer and they can uh, they can say to the doctor in advance that they want a type of uh, treatment. So for example, that could be uh, chemotherapy. Yeah. So uh, when they do lose capacity, um, the doctor can say that actually when they had capacity, they gave me the um, consent to perform chemotherapy on the yeah. patient. Yeah. And that brings up an important point from Kenji, which is that you can't give consent if you don't have capacity. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll cover that later in the video. Definitely. Okay, so let's talk about who should seek consent. Mm. Um, and basically, it's any healthcare professional doing any kind of procedure to a patient. Yeah. Um, you always want to ask for and make sure that you have consent. Mm. And it's usually the uh, senior clinician in charge. So it's normally the consultant or the registrar who is offering the treatment. So let's say a patient comes in and they're seen by the consultant. Um, if the consultant is offering a treatment, they should normally be the ones uh, who ask for consent. But there are some ex exceptional circumstances. Uh, so for example, when the person, when the doctor who advised um, the treatment isn't there, mm -hmm. it can be any clinician who has the uh, skills and training to do so. Yeah. Um, but again, um, if you're the person who is doing the, the certain procedure, you need to make sure that the, um, the consent has been taken and has been given. Yeah, so every step of the way, you have to make sure that you have consent and even if you're with the same patient for a prolonged period of time, carrying out multiple different procedures, you need yeah. consent at each and every one of them. Definitely, because things can change. So that the, mm -hmm. the patient could lose capacity. Yeah. So when you spoke to them, they could have had capacity. And then a few years later, they actually lose capacity, like the, the dementia gets worse or something. Yeah. And the, the circumstance changes. So yeah. they might also be totally healthy and fine, but they just don't like you. Yeah. Exactly. Or they yeah. thought that you didn't do a good job with the previous uh, procedure that you were doing and they don't want you anymore. So mm -hmm. you have to always continue asking, always make sure that the patient is comfortable and okay with what you're doing. Definitely. In certain situations, you're going to need more than just verbal consent. You're going to need written consent. Mm -hmm. And some of those, maybe if you've been uh, to theater before, if you've undergone surgery, you know that you have to give written consent. Yeah. Um, so that's something that you sign for, you sign a piece of paper after you're supposed to have read and understood mm -hmm. all the complications that could arise or any risks, anything like that. Um, so on top of that, whenever consent is gained, you always want to make sure that it's written down and noted in the medical notes, mm -hmm. that a history of it has been kept and taken so that no one can come and say later, you know, this person didn't give me consent or yeah. I didn't consent important. to this. It's very important to always have that written down yeah. for legal reasons as well. Yeah. Yeah, so there is no legal requirement to have written consent for any procedure. But like Nasser said, there are some circumstances where it is advisable. So where there's a very large risk to the health of the patient. Mm. So let's say it's a very invasive procedure like surgery. There are yeah, points like that where you definitely should get consent. Um, mm. But it's, you know, it's not written down, it's not legally required. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so next point is um, how long is consent valid? Mm-hmm. Um, and consent isn't something you do one off. It's not like a one off thing where you take the box and it's done. Yeah. It's something that should be um, done for a very long period of time and it should be an ongoing process. Yeah. So yeah, like you said, consent is a continual process because anything can change. Mm-hmm. Um, so you want to get, you want to gain consent when there's been a period of time between the last time you gain consent and this time that you've gained consent. Mm-hmm. Also with differing levels of uh, invasiveness or difficulty in procedures or anything like that increased risk yeah you want to continue gaining consent yeah because it may need it may need to be reaffirmed mm-hmm. so like Nessa said if there is a long time between speaking to patients um, if any new information come becomes available about a certain type of treatment um, it may need to be uh, taken again yeah 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 all right so next question is can a competent patient refuse uh, treatment so competent people people who have capacity can always refuse treatment mm. um, pretty much no matter what, unless they're presenting a risk to the public or to other people. Mm-hmm. Um, in that case, then maybe you'd have to treat them. So even if that involves um, harm to themselves, mm-hmm. so even if it sounds like a stupid decision or you know they're not very, uh, not making the best decision clinically yeah. or medically, um, it's fine. You know, even if it's gonna kill them or they are gonna die as a result of this treatment, uh, result, sorry, a result of not receiving treatment, mm-hmm. um, you have to respect their wishes yeah. if they have capacity. So, uh, we said before that when a patient gives consent, it has to be informed consent. So the mm-hmm. patient has to know everything that's going on before they can agree and say yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so what is informed consent? So what, what is, informed is informed consent specifically? Mm-hmm. I have a list here from a lovely book called Doing Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget the author, but it's really, really common in the US and Canada for okay. preparing for interviews. Plug, plug. Um, would definitely recommend it. <laughs> plug, plug. <laughs> um, anyway, so informed consent consists of um, having a discussion of the exact nature of the proposed treatment, the alternatives to that treatment, the prognosis with or without treatment, the risks and benefits of the treatment and of the alternatives, serious risks, even if unlikely, and any questions the patient may have. Cool. So that last point is also really important. Mm-hmm. It's not only about what you can tell the patient and you like saying, okay, I told them the risks, I told them the benefits, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. It's also about the patient experience, you know? What do they understand about this procedure? What do they understand about how it's going to affect them? And you need to make sure that what they understand is on the same page with what you're saying. Definitely. So next one is, um, in an emergency situation where the patient can't provide consent, mm-hmm. uh, can treatment still be provided? Yeah. And in a situation like this, um, you should always take into the account of the best interests of the patient. Yeah. Um, so let's say, for example, they came to A&E and they're unconscious and you don't know who they are, uh, what they want. You'd always uh, provide treatment in the best interest of the patient. Yeah. Um, unless there's evidence of an advanced refusal. So mm-hmm. if you looked into their patient notes and you knew who this patient was, and they had a do not actively do not attempt resuscitation mm-hmm. uh, form, uh, then in that situation you wouldn't provide emergency treatment, even yeah. though it might be in the best interest medically. Yeah. yeah, but generally, if someone is in an emergency situation and they don't have capacity and they can't give consent, it's assumed that they want to be saved. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can give treatment or provide yeah. help. Exactly. An example of where they might have an advanced refusal is, like I said, the uh, do do not attempt resuscitation, or for example, Jehovah's Witness. So mm-hmm. if you know a patient is um, so in support of Jehovah's Witness, you wouldn't provide a blood transfusion, for example, yeah. in A&E, even if it means that that will save their life. Mm-hmm. Um, so something else that we want to talk about is children mm-hmm. and people under the age of 16 in the UK. Um, the cutoff is sort of under the age of 16 for yeah. assuming that children don't have consent. Mm-hmm. So if someone comes in under the age of 16, you can't <coughs> automatically assume that they're fully competent and they're mm-hmm. fully engaged and informed and can provide consent. Yeah. Um, but what you can do with under 16s is assess their capacity and mm-hmm. assess their ability to give consent. Because mm-hmm. for example, you can find that a 16 year old is extremely mature, is extremely informed and understands yeah. everything that's going on. And then they may be able to give consent. Yeah. But before then, it's not something that's assumed. Definitely. So in a situation where um, the patient is not is below 16 mm. and you've assessed them with the Gillick competence test and you realize that they actually don't have capacity or don't have the ability to give consent, um, it's normally the person of parental um, responsibility who would give uh, consent. Yeah. So like moms can give consent for children to receive, let's say, the flu vaccine. Yeah. Um, or whatever, any topical treatement for yeah. allergies or anything like that. Mm. And although children have the ability to give consent, they don't necessarily have the ability to refuse treatment. Um, so let's say a kid is you know, 12 years old and they really don't want to receive treatment for um, whatever condition they might be going through. Mm. Um, it's a bit tricky, but they can't exactly say that they don't want treatment. Right. I remember like, my mom used to hold me down to get uh, vaccines. Oh, really? She'd hold me in the seat, but I used to run. 
<laughs> oh my god, they never used to be able to catch me. <laughs> when I told my mum, like, I was, you know, like two weeks ago when we gave the vaccine, the yeah. vaccines, yeah. Yeah. mum was laughing because she, she was like, what? How many of you are giving vaccines when you used to hate vaccines? <laughs> so, Kinch, I have a question for you. Got me. Um, what if there was a patient? That, what did I just say? Got me. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, go on, mate. <laughs> okay. Take two. All right. Yo, Kenji, <laughs> got a question for you. Go for me, bro. So, let's say there was a patient yeah. who lacks consent. Okay. And there's no immediate family or family in general okay. to help make a decision on the patient's behalf. Okay. What do you do as the doctor? Okay. So if it's like a minor treatment, so it's, you know, if it's taking blood pressure or something very minor, mm. you don't need to, the doctor can do that, it's fine. Okay. But let's say it's some serious medical intervention that needs to be performed, like a surgery uh, or something very, very invasive, something very serious. Um, you'd have to seek an independent mental capacity advocate. Mm -hmm. So this is basically someone who, um, this is a full-time job and their, their role is to take over uh, decision-making for a patient. Because if the patient lacks capacity, they have no family at all, um, you have to have that IMCA person to uh, make decisions mm -hmm. on behalf of the patient. Definitely Google IMCA. Yeah. <laughs> know a little bit about IMCA. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. So to kind of wrap this video up, uh, what factors are important when considering the patient's best interests? Patient's best interests. So mm -hmm. if they don't have capacity. Uh, just generally. Yeah. Generally. Yeah. What the, yeah. Okay. So within the scope of the patient's best interest, you want to consider mm -hmm. patient's wishes. Yep. patient's views, what they think, what they previously said that they want done or don't want done. Mm. Um, following that, the wishes of the family, yep. close members of family. Some friends. And friends as well, yeah. yeah. They close might friends. know the patient very, very well. Mm -hmm. um, after that, treatment possibilities. So yep. whether a treatment is, is likely to be successful or not, yep. um, all the different kinds of treatments out there. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's more than one option as well, which is uh, the least restrictive option. Mm -hmm. So the one that will be best you know, for the patients. Um, and even if uh, something is, there is like this best treatment which is supposed to be uh, better for the health, it may not necessarily be best for the patients. Mm -hmm. So you want to you know choose a pe the type of treatment which is best. Uh, you know that will suit the patient yeah. best. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and that that really comes back to holistic yeah. medicine, yep. which is also yep. something super important for you guys in your interviews. Um, always treat the patient as a whole. Yeah. So not, not just, just, just not just themselves and not just medically. Mm -hmm. So biopsychosocial models. Mm -hmm. And also looking at who surrounds the patient, like yep. a treatment for a patient, like Kenji said, might be best, mm -hmm. but it might not be best for, yep. you know, everything else in the, in yeah. the patient's life. I mean, it might affect their quality of life, so it might increase their life another two years. But what's the point of increasing their life another two years? Mm -hmm. It's going to be, suffering. you know, very, you know, yeah, very, very, very suffering bad, life. Bad life. <laughs> very suffering life? Yeah, very bad life. Super <laughs> suffering. <laughs> All right. Also, um, what is the likelihood of the patient improving? Mm -hmm. That's something you need to take into oh, account. Sure. Sure, sure. Uh, the knowledge of any religious views, any cultural views, and any non-medical views as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably it. Dope. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Anything else you'd like to add? <laughs> <laughs> did you enjoy the video? <laughs> Leave a like if you did. <laughs> Subscribe to the channel. Yeah, all that. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much for watching, guys. Thanks. Um, I hope this video has been somewhat informative for you guys. Um, check Nasser out. I'll put all the links to his yep. channel uh, on the screen, his you know social media, his Instagram, and all of that. Give the video a like if it's helped you in any way or form. Go show Nasha some love as well. Um, and let us know what you guys would like to see in the next coming videos. And a comment down below. Yep. So thank you so much for watching and we'll see you guys in the next one. Peace. <laughs> Beats are that nice. <laughs>